Wait, I am going to start recording now. Okay. So continue to pose. Like, <laughs> I'm going to grope myself. <laughs> you know how women like adjust their bra straps all the time? Sure. And, and like that's legitimate. Yeah, yeah. Like I think we have a right to like, without being embarrassed about it, because like our yeah. junk hangs out of our bodies and. Women get to adjust this without like people being like, oh my god. But, like a guy who like adjusts his dick. What about thongs? Are we allowed to adjust that? No, 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 thongs. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no thongs. That's where you draw the line. Yeah, thongs are verboten. Oh. Jock straps? Jock straps are fun. Okay, good. <sighs> Hello! Welcome back to What's a Safe Word. I'm Amp. And I'm Dan Savage with Savage Love and the Savage Love Cast. And today we're gonna talk about kink discordant relationships. But before we do that, Dan, if Somehow the people on here don't know who you are. What do you do? Uh, I have been writing Savage Love, a sex and relationship advice column for 26 years and for about the last decade, hosting the Savage Love Cast, which is a podcast sex and relationship show. Which I am a huge fan of. Before I'd ever met you, I had listened to all, I don't even know how many episodes now you are a at. Billion. A billion. A billion, yes. And I'm a fan of What's the Safe Word, so Mutual Appreciation Society. Thank you. Meeting commences. Sometimes people say that they love our podcast. I rarely correct them because podcasts are generally just audio. Oh, this yeah. is a vlog, right? Yeah, or just a channel. Channel works. Not to be confused with a channel, which is a different thing. What's a channel? It's the tunnel underneath the English Channel. That Connects oh my France God. and Great Britain. I, edit that out. <laughs> no, 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 I'm cares. leaving that in. <laughs> I have Dan Savage making puns. <laughs> really lame, low no, hanging fruit no, no, puns. No. Along the same tracks. <laughs> <laughs> That's even worse. So, Dan, you brought about this term. Like, I, I know about different kinds of relationships with different kinds of levels of kink, mm -hmm. but you had brought up this term kink discordant, which I actually really like. Do you mind just kind of defining that real quick? Well, it's riffing on uh, zero discordant, which we talked about a lot in the 80s and 90s, which was somebody who was HIV negative, who was partnered with somebody who was HIV positive, and the particular pressures on the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I threw out kink discordant relationship once just to mean someone who's kinky with someone who's vanilla or not as kinky or doesn't have the same kinks, because that generates a lot of conflict in relationships. A lot of the mail and calls I get at Savage love are from people in kink discordant relationships. Somebody who's into whatever, who's with somebody who is not only not into it, but not willing to do it, or actively turned off by it, and how do you manage that kind of a relationship? How do you stay together and finesse that disconnect, that discordance? And this discordance can exist with people who have like kink and non-kink relationships, but also with two kinksters together, right? Right. You never find two people that are into every single thing at least I've never found two people that are into every single like checkbox right. together. There's, there are no perfect matches. There's no lid for your pot. Everything is gonna rattle around. There's also no settling down without some settling for. You can't get everything you want in one relationship. Even in an open relationship, you're not gonna get everything that you want. And I often talk on my show and in my column about the price of admission. There are prices of admission that you're willing to pay to be with someone. If you aren't willing to pay that price of admission, you shouldn't be in that relationship. Um, if there's no price you'll pay, if you won't settle at all ever, you're gonna be not partnered all your life, which is fine. Not everybody needs to be paired or thruppled or quadrupled or quintupled up, but uh, you can't have everything that you want. And a lot of shitty relationship advice out there that people get from shitty relationship advice outlets tells people not to settle, that you should be able to have everything and everything you want. And whether you're talking heterosexual, Christians, missionary position, uh, traditional kind of relationship, or uh, more non-traditional kind of relationships, or queer relationships, or kink relationships, nobody gets everything that they want. So is there like a Kohl's for kinksters? <laughs> if you I, need to return something or just like get something bargain? I, I, there ought to be, but there ain't. Your overlap is never going to be no, perfect. You're, it's always a Venn diagram and it's never mm -hmm. a perfect circle. There's, there's a lot of overlap and you want to have a lot of overlap. And you want to be, I often talk in my column and my show about GGG, mm -hmm. you want to be with someone who takes pleasure in giving you pleasure. I don't ascribe to the thought that you should never do anything in bed or the dungeon that you don't want to do. You should never do anything that traumatizes you, mm -hmm. that is a huge libido killer for you. But if you can't take pleasure in giving pleasure, you're a shitty sex partner. Don't do something that leaves you curled up in the fetal position on the floor sobbing afterwards. Mm -hmm. But if there's something that you can do for your partner that's not your thing, but they love it, and you're incapable of tapping into the joy and pleasure that you're giving them and taking pleasure in that, you need to work on that. 
<laughs> and for people that don't follow you or have never heard us use the term GGG, that stands for good giving and game. Good and bad, you gotta acquire those mm -hmm. skills. Giving, sometimes you give pleasure without an expectation of immediate return. Mm -hmm. And game for anything within reason. Clue, monopoly. <laughs> no, no, like oh. up for anything. <laughs> Kingsters shouldn't neglect their partner's vanilla interests either. Yeah. Uh, but game for anything within reason. It's a very important caveat within reason. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're with somebody who wants to shit in your mouth and scat isn't something that you enjoy, GGG doesn't compel you to go there. There are certain kinks that I call kinks too far, and the oh. internet exists to bring the people with those kinks together with people who share them. There are mm -hmm. certain things that a person can't just do for you and take pleasure in your pleasure because they're too extreme. They're, they're too much. It does not apply <laughs> if it makes you uncomfortable miserable, cry, traumatized, leaves you in pain, does physical damage. No, you don't have to do those things to be GGG. Well, Dan, you didn't have an acronym that covered all those letters. That's what we reason <laughs> means. So what you're saying is if you're not into scat and your partner is, you're not a shitty person if you make them <laughs> yes. go elsewhere? You're not a okay. shitty person oh, if you just make wanted to make You're sure. literally not shitty. <laughs> you shit on you. So for GGG, I have definitely had my partners that weren't on the same level and weren't kinky before and I think that they were really GGG, like they were doing everything they could to indulge you, yeah. to, to meet your needs, yeah. but it didn't work for you because it wasn't a need of theirs also at the same time that they were meeting. Well, it was more that they had a self-imposed like, oh, well, I'm not into it, and so you're not going to be into it, or I'm not hard, and so now you're not hard. And so I felt bad that they were doing their best, but they still felt like our relationship was failing. Mm. And it eventually snowballed down and it did fail because we weren't connecting. It doesn't always work. Yeah. The, the GGG principle when you've got a kinkster and a vanilla person, um, you can't just add GGG and then that takes off. They have to work together, the kinkster and the vanilla person, mm -hmm. to find the things that uh, resonate with the kinksters kinks and what they mean and what they symbolize and that the vanilla person also enjoys you know there are people who want to be tied up but only want to be tied up by somebody who's just as excited to tie them up sure. as they are to be tied up and if you're being indulged by someone and they're not really into it especially if they're telegraphing that to you yeah they're letting you know as you do it that okay i'm meeting your need but i could give a fuck and when are we done Right, that is not sexy. That is not going to work. And that's not GGG technically, is it? That's not GGG okay. because you're not being good. Mm -hmm. You're being grouchy. <laughs> it's the wrong G. I always say there are two types of people you meet at big kink events. Mm -hmm. People who were kinky all their lives. The guys who were tying themselves up when they were 12 years old and beating off about uh, Batman and Robin being tied up and tortured when they were 12 years old. And you meet the guys who fell in love with those guys. Yeah. And gradually came around and, and suddenly they were going through the motions a little bit for their partner but then it hit a groove for them and they got kinky too. Like it just took root. Mm -hmm. It was always there in the one who was jacking off when they were 12, tying themselves up. But, and th I think you're, this is where you're going, but I'm gonna ask it anyway so that I get a word in so people know that I'm here too. <laughs> no. Sorry, I'm just gonna show all by myself. <laughs> So, Who but- are you? I don't work with co-hosts. Okay, well this is your show now. No, I'm just gonna- <laughs> <laughs> This is your show. So with those people that then take root, I find that sometimes you get like this shaken up like soda bottle and they just explode and they are all over the place and they zoom past the kinkster who's been yep. kinky all their lives. They make up for a lost time. It often seems that the guy who's tying himself up when he was 12 is a very set, uh, palette of turn-ons and things they want to do because they've been like fantasizing about a very specific thing since they were 12 and and not a limited repertoire but just this is what works for them and the guy who like it took root is just like I want to do this and this and this mm -hmm. and this and more and more and more and more and that can be very exciting but what do you do when that happens? Well, if you were the kinky partner asking the vanilla guy to come along and come around uh -huh. and meet your needs, and then your vanilla partner is suddenly like developing new and exciting interests, and you have to return that mm -hmm. favor and go with them and be GGG in return. This is your fault. No, yes. just... <laughs> I want to jump to an issue that often comes up uh, sure. when people write me about it, which is, I'm kinky, how do I tell my partner? Absolutely. And this comes up often early in dating, particularly when people don't meet their, via a dating app. Like gay men are very, you can't be a gay man unless you said, I'm a gay man. Everything after that is easy. You told your mother you put dicks in your mouth. Telling your boyfriend you want to be peed on is not as scary as telling your mother that you put dicks in your mouth, right? 
Yeah. I, I would say don't do that at the same time, though. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> don't talk to your mother with your mouth full. She doesn't like that. If you met somebody not in a venue where you're like listing your likes and preferences, mm -hmm. then you have to lay your king cards on the table. You have to disclose. You have to tell them. And if you really like them, and it's like a month or two in, and you're afraid of being rejected, it can be scary mm -hmm. to tell them that you're kinky or you want to do these things or this is what really makes your dick hard. And my feeling is that's a rejection that you should rush at, not right away. One of the things you really want to communicate to a potential new partner is that you have good judgment. And blurting out all the kinky things you like on the first date, if you didn't meet at a kink venue, betrays bad judgment. You might mm -hmm. blurt all those things out to somebody who's also kinky, but he's gonna think, why would you say all that before the salad came? That's weird. <laughs> um, but if you know, you're three months in and you're worried that they're gonna reject you because you're kinky, you should embrace that rejection because mm -hmm. if you tell them that this is who you are sexually and they are not into that and into you, you're not right for each other. Yeah. And you need to get back out there and find somebody who is right for you. The trick is though, when you disclose your kinks, it isn't a tragedy. You aren't telling someone that you have terminal leukemia. You're telling somebody that there's aspects of your sexuality that are different and fun and exciting. It isn't a leukemia diagnosis. It's Christmas morning. This, this isn't tragic news. These are yeah. your presents. If you're with me, these are the things we get to do that are gonna make our sex life fun and different and varied and never boring. And if you roll it out that way as something exciting and positive about you, you're likelier to get an excited, positive response. Yeah. So as we've mentioned, you have a podcast that's pretty well known. You're not unfamiliar with answering questions, giving advice. That is literally what I do for a living. That is your job. So I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of that consensually. And I have some questions here from people online about kink discordant sorts of relationships. I grant you my enthusiastic consent to ask me questions. I mean, you could add a little bit more enthusiasm, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, ask me some questions. I'm so excited. Okay, there we go. Please ask oh, me some questions. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, ask me some questions. <laughs> <laughs> the first question comes from Wilm Runner NCSU, uh, and it says, Yes, I've been in a seven-year relationship with someone who's kinked discordant with them. Uh, he seems to rather want to mess up with others over me. How do you reopen the communication lines without becoming angry or passive-aggressive? If you're willing to play, to, to indulge your partner, to explore their kinks with them, and they're more interested in doing those with other people, that could mean lots of different things. Uh, you know, somebody who's really submissive may have a harder time subbing with their lover or their husband than with some like dominant kind of archetypey stranger, someone who is only that in their lives, that sort of dominant presence. And it may be easier for them to tap into what they enjoy about submission with someone they don't know well, with somebody whose farts they don't have to smell in the middle of the night. But if they're doing these things with other people, that's a conversation to have about not your inadequacy, but divorce your ego from it and have a conversation about why it works better with others, why he's more comfortable exploring these kinks with other people. It may be a reason that has literally nothing to do with you. You have to take your ego out of it. I think you just saved their relationship. You should do this for a living. <laughs> even partly open relationships that you don't say everything that you're doing with other people to your partner, being able to get past that it sometimes makes you a little bit closer. And you might both be thinking the same thing, you just don't know how to open up and talk to the other person about it. Right. But then it's about letting go of your ego usually. Yes. And letting go of the, the idea that I'm supposed to be everything. I think we answered his question, <laughs> albeit Long, long... Well, when people don't give you enough details, you kind of have to like... You have to cover all the bases. Yeah, cover all the bases. Yeah, I, home run. So, uh, next up, we have a question from Locked Variables saying, I'm the more kinky slash horny one. How do I help my partner get over feelings of shame and sex he developed by growing up? Well, you tell him to go get a therapist if he's struggling with feelings of shame. <laughs> you aren't his therapist, you're his partner. And there are things that a partner can't do, and a partner isn't a shrink. You can't necessarily help him get over those feelings of shame. You can set a good example for him as being someone who isn't paralyzed by those feelings of shame. And I don't say this as a smug person who never experienced or struggled with shame. You know, I was Catholic, brought up by very Same. conservative Catholics. Same. And I had a really important first boyfriend, uh, Tommy Ladd, RIP, rest in peace Tommy. Oh. And I was really still struggling at that time. I was like 18, 19 years old, still struggling with conflict about just being gay, much less kink or anything else. And he didn't get upset at me, and he didn't shame me for feeling shame, mm -hmm. which only makes it worse. Yeah. He was just very loving. And he set an example, because he didn't, wasn't paralyzed by shame. And I wanted to be more like him, and I got there. 
support is very important. Uh, would you say that representation and just showing them friendly content, whether it's your podcast, our YouTube channel, other <clears throat> other resources that Absolutely. make it very friendly and, and approachable? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of people outside the kink scene um, who don't know any kinky people who've never had any kinky sex, who have stereotypes in their head and a misimpression about what it's really about because they're looking at porn or porn's all they've seen, the only representation yep. they've seen. And it's scary. And it is scary and it's meant to be scary in a way. Sure. And that's often Some people like arousing. that. Right. But for those but that aren't used to it. Kink porn bears as much resemblance to the lives of actual kinksters as straight commercial mainstream porn bears to the lives of your straight parents. Oh, kink porn is not sexy behind the scenes. Oh, I can vouch for that. <laughs> you know, a lot of people who are into kink and want to get their partners into kink will show them kink porn. And a lot of what you don't see in kink porn is affection, is humor, is connection, is intimacy. And all of those things are a part of kinky sex when actual kinksters are having it. All of that winds up uh, edited out in the porn. So while there's tons of bondage equipment in this room, I don't want to keep you <laughs> too long. What are just some, some quick last minute pointers you would give to discordant relationships? They're not seeing eye to eye, whether it be kinky or just in general. Well, if your partner's open to going to some uh, fetish events, definitely go to some fetish events. Start with a munch, not a play party. Meeting other people who are kinky. If you have friends, if you have friends bring them kinky. over. Don't make it about kinks first, but get them acclimated. And sometimes the solution in a relationship with a kink discordance is openness which is we have our thing and there's these kinks that you enjoy and you are free to do them with someone else. It isn't fair for the vanilla person to say to the kinky person, you may not do these things or even fantasize about these things. I hear from people whose partners don't even want them looking at kink porn. Um, a kinky person wouldn't say to a vanilla person, you're not allowed to fantasize about or, or we're not gonna do vanilla sex. Mm -hmm. And a lot of vanilla people think, well, it's just kink. Uh, do it once and get it out of your system. That's not how kink works. Nope. Um, kink is as intrinsic and hardwired for a kinkster as all the vanilla things are for a vanilla star, which is another <laughs> maybe should be. Are you gonna be coining that term next? Yeah. You have to find a way for everybody to get what they want, recognizing not everybody gets everything that they want, but enough of what they want to be content. Mm -hmm. And that may be outsourcing. Outsourcing is often a really great way to do this. Your partner's into like crazy intense bondage and you're not and you don't want to learn how to do shibari and you don't want to be responsible for keeping your partner mummified for three hours or whatever and they have a bondage buddy who loves to do that with them if your partner liked to bowl and you hated bowling you wouldn't resent your partner for going bowling with other people That's what is it point. about the addition of the boner that makes it a no-go if it takes the pressure off you to meet these needs that you aren't interested in meeting and there's no threat to your relationship for these needs to be met outside it there's the solution, there's the fix often for a kink discordant relationship. Mm -hmm. That isn't trying to make a kinkster out of the vanilla person or trying to make a vanilla person out of the kinkster, which never works. You can never <laughs> make a vanilla person out of a kinkster. You can make a kinkster out of a vanilla person. But with that, I'd say they were always kind of kinky. I, I, the kink awakened something mm -hmm, in them. It tapped mm -hmm. into some erotic script, something in their erotic imagination. It really worked with their erotics yeah. and, and it grew. Put them in an environment where it awakened yeah. something inside them. If there's, that's not inside them, it may never awaken and you will need an accommodation that allows the kinkster to get their needs met and be who they are and be fulfilled sexually mm -hmm. and allows you to have your needs met and allows the two of you to be together. But regardless of if they blossom or not, you need to be patient and give them time. You have to let them test waters. Right. You have to be forgiving of they're not used to this yeah. yet. And then you can't be a fucking entitled selfish kinky dick. If your partner uh, has primarily vanilla needs, but like enjoys your kinks, goes there with you, takes pleasure in the pleasure they're providing you, and you neglect their needs, you neglect to provide them with the 100% vanilla intercourse that they enjoy mm -hmm. much of the time, then you're being selfish. You're also taking for granted a really great and indulgent partner that you're gonna miss when they dump you. A straight couple where the husband was into uh, diapers and baby play and this and that, and once he got his wife to start doing it with him, he refused to do anything else. Anything else. And then she <laughs> left him. And it's sure. gonna be hard for him to find another wife who's into diapers because there's not a lot of women out there into diapers. You don't neglect that person's needs mm -hmm. if they're willing to be the indulgent partner and the GGG partner. And to add on to that, 
people that are, for some reason, they think that they can find a better person, this person that has kinks, but they're perfect otherwise, and they can't settle with those kinks because they think that they're gonna find someone that's even more perfect. <laughs> or not kinky. Yeah, kidding yourself there. <laughs> I once uh, had a woman write me because she was a college student and a waitress, and she would come home every night after these shifts, and her boyfriend would massage her feet for an hour, and she thought this was so loving and selfless, and then he told her that he was he a was foot into fetishist. into it, oh, I knew it. And she broke <laughs> up with him. And Wait, what? what? She, and what she said to me was, I want to meet a normal guy. And I said, good luck with that. And introduced what I call the karmic rule of kink, which is if you <laughs> you dump the honest foot fetishist, you will marry the lying necrophiliac. Dump the guy who disclosed his like workable kinks and go find the guy with no kinks at all. And went out of his way to make you feel comfortable. That was a kid. How is that? How, That's how, not a bad thing. Oh my God, you're <laughs> on your feet for an eight hour shift and you have a foot fetishist boyfriend waiting at home? Yahtzee. Clue. Monopoly. You won. Bingo. Ah, lady, take him back. <laughs> if he'll have you, take him back. She had no soul. He probably put his foot down. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people who... Uh, took me a minute. Pardon the pun, but would you say that it would help to walk a mile in their shoes? <laughs> it would help to walk a mile in their shoes, unless you're wearing shackles. Or stilettos, like six inch. I can't. A lot of people who are in kink discordant relationships, when they are early in the relationship, they are in despair because they think this can never work. But if you are as old as I am and have been giving advice for as long as I have been giving advice, I know and I've met a lot of kink discordant couples who've been together 5, 10, 15, 20 years and found a way to make it work and it becomes very joyful. So don't assume if you're just in the throes and drama of the how are we going to make this work that it can never work because the kink community is full of kink discordant couples that made it work. And understanding people. Sometimes you just got to talk about it. Yeah. Don't just assume things. Yeah. Whew. Speaking of talking, I feel like I've forced you to talk so much so I'm going to quickly just we're gonna end this. I'm going to thank you first and foremost for coming on. I love all your work it was and my what you pleasure. do. You've been on the Savage Lovecast, and thank I have. you. So we always end every episode uh, first by telling people that your kinks matter. But regardless of if you are kinky or vanilla or anywhere in between, we always ask that you have a safe word when you're playing. And so we always ask that the guest says the safe word of the day, which you get to choose. And the safe word today is Stormy Daniels. I don't need any sort of pun for that. That's just, yeah, that, that's a joke in itself. I mean the president at least. You know, if you, some people like safe words, which means stop, let's let's talk, and then let's jump back in. And some people have, want to have safe words that are like, it's over. And I think a safe word like Ivanka Trump or or oh. President Trump is a great way to chase all the erections out of the room. Stop, my, my dick can't go more into my body. Dan. <laughs> Dan, where can people find you? What do you do? Where do what do you want to plug? Uh, Besides you, yourself, you can. I have people for that. <laughs> You can find the Savage Lovecast at savagelovecast.com. You can find Savage Love My Column at my home paper, thestranger.com, as well as the East Bay Express and SF Weekly and papers all over the country and Canada and a paper in Italy in Italian. If you guys have any questions for Dan, leave them down below. Maybe I'll ask him to come back sometime if he's ever in the city. I would love to. Leave a like if you enjoyed this kind of content and we'll see you guys next time on What's a Safe Word. Bye. Bye. I want to get in that cage now. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just, I'm going to take down the camera. I definitely won't turn the camera and record you climbing into the cage. That would just be taking advantage of you.